Hi, I'm Dr. Russell Cohen. I'm a professor of medicine and the director of the Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center here at the University of Chicago. Many of our patients or families ask us a simple question. What's causing their Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, their inflammatory bowel disease, IBD? Well, the information is not exactly straightforward. Our best understanding comes from a few areas. The first are genetics. Believe it or not, we at the University of Chicago identified the first Crohn's disease gene simultaneously with a separate research group in France. The NOD2 gene, as it's called, is responsible for how your body's immune system interacts with your gut flora, the bacteria, the yeast, and the other things running around inside your intestines. Turns out that if we didn't have those bacteria, yeast, and things running around in your intestines, you wouldn't digest your food. However, your body is supposed to ignore them. In other words, get along with them uh, so that they just digest your food and leave you alone. However, not only the NOD2 gene, but most other genes for Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis have been associated with defective interactions between the immune system and you, the host, the body. Uh, we thought genetics would be the answer. However, as of today, there's over 150 genes that we have been associated with these diseases. So it's unlikely that's going to be the only answer. So let's talk about the immune system. I already told you the problem is that genetically, the immune system is not adapting correctly. We're supposed to get along with our gut bacteria. And sure, sometimes you might get a problem with infection in your gut that your body takes care of. We've all had those wonderful moments uh, in, in, in the washroom. However, your body's supposed to reset uh, and go back to normal. And for some reason, patients with Crohn's and colitis, it doesn't happen. And this is important for you to understand because most of the medicines that we're going to discuss discusses this exact issue about having to control the immune system, not too much, but just enough to get you back to normal. So your body stops attacking you as it's trying to get rid of what it pretends to be an actual infection. Now, there are certain environmental triggers many patients with Crohn's and colitis know. Stress is a trigger. In patients who have Crohn's disease, smoking is a trigger. In fact, we really urge Crohn's patients to stop smoking. Smoking is associated with not only bad Crohn's, but recurrent Crohn's, Crohn's by the bottom, the anal area. And if we do surgery in Crohn's disease, smokers get it back sooner. Interesting, ul ulcerative colitis patients who are uh, don't get ulcerative colitis when they're smokers, but there are some people who get ulcerative colitis when they stop smoking. Not a reason not to stop smoking, but it is something to discuss with your physicians if that happens to you at the time. There are certain medicines, most commonly those related to the NSAIDs, which would be ibuprofen, um, uh, aspirin, that whole family of medicines uh, that seem to trigger or cause worsening IBD in some patients. Acetaminophen, or Tylenol, if you will, seems to be harmless and is useful, but only in the doses that are prescribed on the package. There are also uh, some other environmental triggers that may occur in individuals, but most commonly we see this happening after a major stressor such as death in the family, new job, moving, breakup in relationship, or a bowel infection. So people may go, for example, with their buddies or girlfriends to an exotic location and have a wonderful time. Everyone comes back, they all get diarrhea, but they got better and you did it. So maybe that was the trigger. But instead of thinking backwards, let's think forward. The approach in Crohn's and colitis is to take you from this day and get you better. Many patients who have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis ask me, how do I know if I'm having a flare? Well, as I teach my fellows, most of the time the flares should parallel the symptoms that you've previously had. For example, some people when they flare get diarrhea, blood, mucus, straining or sensation that they can't get up from the bathroom toilet because they have to go back right down again. Other people don't. Some people get constipated, some get pain, some lose their appetite, some get fevers, some get rashes on their legs, on their arms, on their face. Some get eye inflammation or mouth sores too. 
So many of the times we say to patients who say, well, maybe I'm having a flare, we say, well, is this your, are these your typical flare symptoms? Because uh, most of the time they are, if it's a true flare. Sometimes though, people have other things that happen in life. You, maybe you said, well, yeah, you know, I did eat something and my spouse also got diarrhea. Okay, well, that's a clue to us that perhaps it's not a flare because your spouse or someone who was at the same meal with you also had diarrhea. Or um, you might say, well, you know, actually, um, my flares are always diarrhea and this is the opposite. I can't go at all. So that's less likely to be the case. Um, many patients, maybe a third to half of them, may have what we call extra-intestinal manifestations of their Crohn's or colitis. Joint pains, even joint swelling, often multiple joints, certain skin rashes, mouth sores, eye inflammation, as I mentioned, a few others. Often the flares are preceded by those symptoms reoccurring, or they happen at the same time. So let's say, for example, you always get joint pains in your right wrist and your left ankle. This is my left wrist, but <laughs> wrist for demonstration state. And now you say, well, you know, I'm getting diarrhea, but I'm not having any of the wrist um, swelling or pain too, less likely to be a flare. So how do we know? Well, first of all, we do what I'm doing right now. We take a history, we ask you and, and clarify, especially if there's other family members, if the same thing is what's going around. Um, the second thing is uh, sometimes we can do what are called non-invasive tests for inflammation. So non-invasive means we're not sticking a scope up your butt, okay? Uh, in, uh, so for example, there's blood tests looking at inflammatory markers. Certain blood tests change, elevate or decrease in the presence of inflammation in some people. There are also stool tests uh, where we can check your stool for not just an infection, but for inflammation. Some patients develop inflammatory markers in their stool as well too. Uh, patients who have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis within the reach of, their, of a colonoscope may sometimes need a colonoscopy. So those who have it in the stomach, you might look in the stomach or get an x-ray or CAT scan or MRI in between. However, we usually don't do these more invasive interventions if it's apparent to us that you are having a flare. So sometimes it's still unclear. So we might experiment on you. Try something that um, perhaps is a mild medicine and just see if it gets better. Maybe just try a mild antidiarrheal, low paramide, over the counter. Does that work? Oh, okay, maybe a course of antibiotics. Some people who get a lot of gas and bloating, we give a one to two week course of a non-absorbable antibiotic. That should help. Um, other times, uh, for example, if, if it's a rash, we might have a cream or something to put on it to see if that goes away. So usually a true flare of disease wouldn't get better with these minor uh, adjustments. So let's say you are having a flare. What should you do? Well, first of all, you should let your healthcare professional team know you're having a flare. If you do have access to a medical record, a electronic medical record um, a portal, you should use that. Unless it's severe, then you should go to the emergency room, call 911, et cetera. But presuming it's not that severe, let them know. They may then get back to you with questions and wanting to know. And then don't be fearful of, of this, even during times when there may be a lot of things going around in the, in the public. It's important that we get on top of your flares right away. So many of our patients who have Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis say to us, well, how do I know we're better? And I say, well, we'd like to get you into remission. Okay, well, that's nice to use a medical term like remission, but the question then comes up, well, what does it mean to be in remission? And it may not seem as straightforward as you might think. So generally remission means there's no sign or symptoms of the condition, but in reality, we're a little more scientific these days. Uh, Back in the old days, Dr. Kersner, who's over my left shoulder there, might be able to just stop there. He would talk to you in the office and see how things going. Diarrhea's gone, blood's gone, everything feels fine. You don't have belly pain, able to eat, you're in remission. Well, maybe you are. But now we also look for other evidence that not only do you feel well, and when I say well, I don't mean going from 20 bowel movements to 10 bowel movements a day, because that is well if you used to go 20, but I'm talking going back to normal. And also we look for evidence of other remission. So for example, biochemical remission. What does that mean? It means a blood test. Uh, white blood cell count back to normal. 
um, inflammatory markers. There's something called C-reactive protein or a, a sedimentation rate. Back to normal. Platelet count back to normal. Markers in the bloodstream, normal. Or uh, stool stream. So we can look in the bowel movement for inflammatory markers. If they were elevated, something called fecal calprotectin or fecal lactoferrin, and now they're normal. So that could be biochemical remission. The, th the third type is called endoscopic remission. Endoscopic remission, you guessed it, means someone sticks a scope in you and all the ulcers that used to be there are gone. So an ulcerative colitis, which, coats, which the ulcers are on the lining of the bowel, the ulcers are gone. In Crohn's, it may be a little harder to see because it does affect the full thickness. So sometimes it may be scoping and or imaging a CAT scan MRI to make sure it's gone. So endoscopic remission means that what the doctor who's holding the scope sees, it's normal. Normal meaning it could have been the next guy or girl coming in for their scope who don't even have Crohn's or colitis. Or the radiologist, radiographic remission, may say, hey, you know, they used to have inflammation and now they don't. That's in remission. Now, one of the more subtle areas that we're researching here at the University of Chicago, my colleague, Dr. David Rubin, has been working on this for a while, is something called Histologic remission. Histologic remission means not only do I, the endoscopist, say, hey, everything looks good, but those biopsies that we take during the colonoscopy or the upper scope, we send them to our pathologist. Pathologist looks under the microscope and he or she says, hey, under the microscope, there's no evidence of inflammation either. So uh, that is almost like the trifecta, if you will. Uh, which uh, is a, it's a nice term to use in Chicago. We haven't had too many of those with our sports teams recently. However, we used to. Um, the idea that we can get someone feeling better, clinical remission, and endoscopic remission, and histologic remission, remission that's, that's the way to go. We can't always get to histologic remission, but we're working on that now as far as what that means. So what does it mean to be in remission? Well, not only do you feel good and look good, but people who are in what we call deep remission, meaning they feel fine and their scope or the radiograph looks fine, perhaps even the histology, they are far more likely to stay well, to avoid being in the hospital, to avoid having surgery, to avoid going, needing to go back on steroid medicines, and possibly, and again, this is where Dave Rubin's research is in, possibly may be at a lower risk of colon cancer than patients who are not in remission. So, the reason that we do strive for remission is because you come to us to put you back to normal. Our goal is to get you back to normal. How do we look at that? We get back to normal clinical remission, your symptoms, endoscopically with the scope, histologically under the microscope if possible, radiographically, all these type of remissions. That's our goal to make you feel better. And it is obtainable in many people. we discuss the fact that patients who have Crohn's or colitis have an immune system that's overactive and attacking their bowel. So all the therapies that we look at try to reverse this and make it normal. The traditional therapies fall into a few families. The first one is related to a drug that many of you may have had called sulfasalazine. Sulfasalazine was created in 1940 by a female rheumatologist, Dr. Nana Schwartz at the Karolinska Institute. It's an anti-inflammatory, misalamine, plus an antibiotic, sulfapyridine. They didn't have penicillin back then. It was only sulfa drugs. So subsequently, the misalamine family, and if you have been on these, you may know them by brand names of Azacol or Pentaza or Colazole or Giazo or Aprizo or, or other similar ones. Um, they coat the lining of your bowel with an anti-inflammatory. Now, the anti-inflammatory is derived from the willow tree. So the willow tree is the source of aspirin as well as mesalamine, which is 5-aminosalicylic acid. Sound the same, don't they? So those of you who have a biochemistry degree, you can give me a call. But the point is, is this me medicine coats the lining of the bowel. Most of it's not absorbed into your body. Uh, you can take it by pill or um, you can take it as an enema or a suppository. Sounds like fun, doesn't it? Uh, the nice thing is most people tolerate this other than sulfasalazine. A lot of people are sulfa allergic, but the problem is it only really works in mild disease. Uh, subsequently, in the 1950s, Sidney Trulove in Britain uh, came across cortisol or steroids. And steroids have been life-changing, life-altering in so many diseases, but they're toxic. They have 
great effects, usually first time, maybe second time, not so much third time, and they have a lot of side effects um, that really prohibit their use long term. Um, as a little aside, a safer steroid, budesonide, which is available in a few different branded names and now generics, too, by mouth or by rectal suppository or foam, is a safer steroid because it doesn't have as many steroid side effects, but still it's not a, a long-term option. And the final class of the traditional medicines are what are called immunosuppressants, and they are immunosuppressants. They were first developed for use as chemotherapy in, in patients with leukemia or to prevent um, rejection of organs. In Crohn's or colitis, your body's white blood cells are attacking your bowel, trying to reject it because they think it's, it, it's not yours. Well, so we steal the medicines from those other areas. Azathioprine, Imuran, 6 mecaptopurine 6-MP, they're uh, effective long-term immunosuppressant medicines that we used to use before we had the biologic therapies, but now we're only using as add-on therapies to those because, quite frankly, they're not as safe. They generally are just uh, effective long-term, but patients sometimes find that they can have problems with some side effects. And we are concerned over long-term risk of certain types of cancers. They are important for those who need them, but we try to move people on to more advanced therapies. And then the other immune suppressant is called methotrexate. Now, you may know people on methotrexate for rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis or uh, similar conditions. We use that more so in Crohn's disease than in ulcerative colitis. Um, it is effective, but it is a medicine that has certain toxicities too. So the traditional medicines for patients with Crohn's and colitis were generally mild, medicines, sulfasalazine and immunososalates, fast-acting but only short-term use allowed steroids, perhaps a little longer-term use budesonide version of the steroids, but still not long-term, and then the immune suppressants, which we've really moved away from as we move to biologic therapies. Biological therapies have revolutionized the treatment of inflammatory diseases. The first one was available in 1998, infliximab. You may know it as a brand name, Remicade, although there are other brand names now. And subsequently, there have been a number of other therapies that have come to the market. Many people are initially fearful of the biologics, but you have to remember that insulin is a biologic, growth hormone is a biologic. We've had biologic therapies for decades. These monoclonal antibodies are actually very complicated, very safe, uh, medicines for patients with inflammatory diseases, certainly safer than steroids or the immune suppressants that I talked about in the previous lecture. So how do we look at about biologics? Well, we generally look at them into families. A family is the mechanism of action that they work. The first family of which had the, the name, as I mentioned, Remicade or infliximab, uh, is blocks something called tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF alpha. Now, it turns out that TNF-alpha probably has nothing to do with tumors in humans, but blocking it is very important in many inflammatory diseases. The first one that came to market was the infliximab, Remicade, then the adalimumab, Humira, then sertilizumab, Simzia, and then finally golimumab, Sympany. They're all related medicines, and they are ones that we use for patients with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Now, subsequently, a second family of medicines came out called anti-integrant antibodies. These work by a completely different mechanism. And for the purpose of today, we're only going to discuss vetalizumab or Antivio. Antivio is used for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And unlike the previous ones, it actually doesn't affect the whole body's immune system. It just prevents the white blood cells from attacking the bowel. It's like a designer drug. We're not aware of any immune side effects infectious side effects, or cancer risks with Intivio. That's why so many people like it. It's given only as IV right now, but we're hoping that an injectable form will become available. The third family that came to market is one that blocks something called interleukin-12 and 23. Is one drug currently used for both Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis called ustekinumab or Stelara. Initially used for psoriasis, this medicine, which is given as one IV dose and then given as shots every eight weeks roughly, uh, is very effective in Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. Uh, the infection risk is very minimal, and we're not aware of any true cancer risk with this medicine either. So this has been very exciting for our patients as well. The fourth family that's available is actually not truly a biologic agent, but it is a pill medicine, uh, the first of a group 
uh, of what's called JAK inhibitors. These medicines are immune suppressants, so they're different than the biologics. They're pill form. The only one currently on the market is tofacitinib, or Zeljans, which is FDA approved uh, in the IBD world for ulcerative colitis. Uh, this is given twice a day, although there is a once a day version now that we often put people on. And that medicine is actually very effective in patients with ulcerative colitis. Since it is an immune suppressant, we have seen uh, higher rates of shingles. Um, so we tell people to get the shingles vaccine ahead of time. And there may be slightly other risks of infections or slight cancer risks as we get the medicine on the market longer. However, many of our patients uh, are younger and at low risk for any of these problems as well. So there are multiple new medicines, not just the ones I mentioned, but other ones in the pipeline, coming down the pipeline as well too. In the families of the injectable, infliximab will likely be an injectable version. In the vetalizumab family, there are other ones that are working their way through the market. Uh, there in the ustekinumab family, there are medicines blocking IL-23 on the market for psoriasis that we're hoping will be for Crohn's and colitis, and as well as other JAK inhibitors as well too. There are other mechanisms, such as ones that are currently used for multiple sclerosis and psoriasis that we're looking at as well. So now the question comes, how do physicians choose which ones to treat patients with? Well, we actually get information from you to help make that decision. For example, if you watch this session about biological therapies and, and the new small molecules, there are some of those therapies that are also available for patients who have rheumatoid arthritis or psoriasis or other inflammatory conditions. In those instances, we may say, hey, let's, quote, get two birds with one stone and use the same medicine to treat the rheumatoid arthritis, let's say, and the ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. So that, for example, may be a medicine in the anti-TNF class. It may be a medicine that is in the JAK inhibitor, which is an oral uh, medicine uh, as well. Uh, for patients who have psoriasis, I mentioned ustekinumab previously was first FDA approved for psoriasis. So that'd be an excellent option for people with psoriasis as well as ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. For patients perhaps who don't have any other inflammatory conditions, we might suggest that you go with a medicine such as vetalizumab, which is gut specific. It's an anti-inflammatory, just prevents uh, the white blood cells from attacking the gut, but doesn't affect the rest of the body. Why have it go through the rest of the body if you don't need to? So part of the information is based on what other things are going on in your body. There's a second issue too to consider. Are you willing to give yourself shots? Some of the medicine are shots you give yourself. Some of them are given as IV. Some are given as pills. Now, you may say, well, I'd rather have pills, but remember the pills you have to take every day, sometimes twice a day, every day. Do you really want to do that? The IVs may be once every two months. Ah, you don't do anything. You're living life free. Just go every eight weeks and get an IV from the medical professional and you go home. Or maybe shots, shots you give yourself every two weeks, every two months, you travel a lot. Um, you don't have time to go to infusion centers. You don't want to take pills, things like that too. So part of it is patient preference. Unfortunately, a third issue is what will your insurance pay for, which is in some ways the first issue. Uh, uh, some of the companies uh, have made deals with insurance companies to get the highest tier. In other words, most favored nation almost, where they um, tell the company, well, you know, we'll give you a good deal on our medicine, but you got to pr provide it. You have to prescribe us first. So that's happening less frequently now than before. Unfortunately, usually when a new medicine comes on the market, it hasn't already made those tiers. So it's hard for us sometimes to give the new medicine first, but that's something that hopefully will be resolved in the future. A, another related issue is patient insurance. So for example, if you have Medicare, Medicare pays for medicines that are given as an IV or medicines that are given as an injection that is given by a healthcare professional. They don't pay for self-injectables. Now you may have a secondary insurance with your Medicare, which I suggest you do, <laughs> um, which may cover that. So we have to balance those things as well. And then finally, there's the safety issue, which really is the first issue, but I, I really wanted to de-emphasize it because those medicines I mentioned are very safe. If you have a previous history of certain types of infections, we might choose one over the other.
uh, certain types of cancers or even a strong family history of certain types of cancers, we might choose one over the other. Let's say you're on um, a different type of medicine for, let's say, gout, for example. If you're on a gout medicine, we might not give one of the um, immune modulators that we've given, azathioprine or Imuran, because that can interact with that medicine. So looking at your medicines that you're currently on, what other conditions you, you have, family history, what your insurance coverage is, what you're willing to do as far as giving yourself injections, going for an IV or taking pills, are all information that we gather and put into kind of like a package and present to you, to our pharmacists and to the insurance and to provide you with the best care. Should you be afraid of side effects of the medicines? Well, let's put things in perspective. For the most part, the medicines that we prescribe generally do not have side effects, with the exception of a few, which I'll cover. The second is, most of the time, it's better to be on a medicine than to be sick with your Crohn's and colitis. And the third thing to remember is the newer medicines, which seem to be scary because they're IV or shots, are actually safer than many of the old medicines. So, Let's talk about medication side effects. The, the gorilla in the room is prednisone or steroids. Steroids not only have short-term, but they have long-term side effects. Uh, they are not effective long-term in either Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. So as a general rule, if you are on steroids, we get you off them and onto something else. Um, if you do have side effects of steroids, um, which you can discuss with your medical provider, they may be able to be mitigated with certain other steps uh, in the process or lowering the dose. But as a result, the medicine with the most side effects, steroids, are the ones that we try to avoid. Patients who get sulfa allergic can't get sulfasalazine, though that's a direct allergy. The non-sulfa containing mesalamines typically are tolerated, they, they don't have sulfa. Uh, medications uh, that are also taken in pill form, such as azathioprine or 6-MP, if they do have side effects, it's usually pretty apparent. It's usually an all or nothing. You either feel great or you feel lousy. And if you feel lousy, we stop it and it goes away. Um, some patients can get problems such as irritation of their pancreas, pancreatitis, or of the liver, but it almost always goes away when you stop the medicine. That's why you have to be in communication with your healthcare team. You, any medicine you start, even if you're taking medicine for some other problem, expect no side effects. If you get any, let your provider know. Methotrexate is another injectable medicine or taken by mouth that also can have nausea and hair loss. So usually dose related, we um, then decrease the dose. But the newer medicines, unless you're allergic or intolerant to them, generally don't have side effects. Now, that may be different than what you read uh, on the internet or here on TV, but be aware that the direct-to-consumer marketing, while it does list side effects, what it doesn't list is what percentage of the patients who are on the placebo also had the same side effects, because almost always it's the same. So what should you though be aware of? You should be aware of that many of the medicines that lower the immune system, you have to be cautious if you have an active infection or if you've had a chronic relapsing infection, such as herpes or, or shingles. Let your healthcare provider know that. Certainly let them know about what allergies you have and what updated what medicines you're on so there isn't a medicine interaction with one of the medicines that your provider may be prescribing as well too. If you are experiencing a potential side effect, make sure that not only do you let them know that, but kind of think back and clarify, is this really from the medicine? A, a, a perfect example are headaches. Okay? Many people say they start a medicine, they have headaches. I would say probably five out of six times if I say to the patient, well, were you having the headaches beforehand? They say, oh yeah, I was. I think they may be more common. No, no, no. <laughs> when we're talking about medication intolerances, it's like you went from none to a lot, and then you stop the medicine and they go away. And you restart and come back again. Uh, there's a little science behind that, um, but the point is, is that um, it's hard when you have a lot of things going on in your body to know what a true side effect is. But Take a deep breath, think back. We are really having this problem ahead of time. Is it really a lot worse? Be aware that some people feel they get hair loss from a lot of the medicines, but hair loss is delayed. And when you start getting better, often from your medicines, your body makes new hair follicles that pushes out the old ones. So often you'll get some hair loss initially, but it's not from the medicine, it's from getting better.
One of the most common questions we ask is, what's the role of diet in patients with Crohn's and colitis? Can you cure your disease with diets? Now, I want to make clear there is a separation between symptoms that you feel, which are important, diarrhea, bloating, constipation, and disease activity, meaning do you have inflammation? When we look with a scope or look under the microscope or get a CAT scan, do you have inflammation? Because your diet can help improve your symptoms, but we haven't really found that diet changes inflammation. And while we do care about symptoms, it's important to also get rid of the inflammation. So maybe use the dietary advice in addition to the medical therapies that we give you to treat your condition. Now, there is some science to particular diets. In fact, we've even done clinical trials comparing people on certain diets. One of the advices I give people, if someone's trying to sell you a book about their diet and they're going to make money on it, you can probably finish the sentence on that one too, okay? But in reality, there is some data suggesting that a Mediterranean diet may be less inflammatory than some others, probably because of the oils that are used rather than the animal fats. It's usually more olive oil, maybe fish oils and things like that too. Um, uh, that's a th theory, but it is probably more direct to what happens in your microbiome as a result of their diets. Uh, many people do feel better on low carb diets because um, they don't get as much gas and bloating because bacteria in your gut eat carbs. They love it. It's uh, uh, like, like culture medium for them too. Um, but be clear that many patients, particularly with Crohn's disease, have trouble getting enough calories in. And if you do have narrowing in your bowel, like many Crohn's patients do, you can't eat high fiber foods. They'll get stuck. They'll block you up. It's, it's a good idea not to have any part of your body ever blocked up, okay? So things that are high fiber, nuts, seeds, corn, popcorn, high fiber foods and things too, may sound great for the dietitian for quote unquote people who don't have Crohn's and colitis to help them have their bowel movements because they're constipated. But if you're having diarrhea all the time, you certainly don't want to help it along with the, with the fiber. And if you have Crohn's and narrowing of your bowel, which many people do, you don't want the fiber to get stuck. Uh, so you do have to be careful about getting too many limits on someone's diet when you're already limiting their diet. They say, well, now I can't eat this, I can't eat that. You're telling me now I shouldn't eat carbs. But, but in reality, many patients do well with sometimes lower carb and um, more protein in their diets. I'm not saying take protein shakes and things too, that muscle builder things, um, which I obviously don't do, but, um, <laughs> uh, uh, and, and supplements are important if you're not getting enough calorie and protein uh, in your diet. However, um, just be aware that when you do get dietary advice, um, sometimes it has to be balanced and, and right for your body. Um, there are some other issues that you do have to know about diet. Let's talk about dairy. Many people um, find that if they have dairy, particularly when they become adults, it goes right through them. You can test this yourself if you're wondering and take the, the uh, lactate pills. So lactate pills um, provide the lac lactase enzyme that your body doesn't make anymore and should digest the milk or the lactose, the sugar in the milk. If that works, then you're lactose intolerant. You can just take that. You can buy the milk or ice cream or little capsules. But some other people are milk intolerant. However, if you're doing well with milk, don't cut that out of your diet. Dairy is a good source, not just of protein, but of, but of vitamin D and calcium. Uh, some of the medicines we talked about previously, corticosteroids, steroids can decrease bone density. So don't cut out dairy if you don't need to. Um, the other issue are, are fats. Generally, lower fat diet is helpful. Um, fats tend to run through people. You don't digest them as well. But make sure that you're not losing weight. It is recommended that you meet with a registered dietitian. We have multiple ones at the University of Chicago, perhaps at your center or your doctor can provide you one too, and get the important, correct dietary advice. This is Dr. Russell Cohen. Thank you again for joining me for this. We want to help you face Crohn's and colitis, and we're with you, with you there as part of your team. Thank you so much.